All right, so should we just do a quick rundown of who we have on the panel and then we'll get right into it. First, we have Chris Fralick from First Round Capital, Chris Young from Revel Partners, Paul Martino from Bullpen, and Steve Master from GTCR. So, my very first question, I go back, way back in time to the very first Luma Partners DMS event that I attended in Manhattan. And what did we talk about pretty much for the entire day? We talked about ad tech. So let's come to ad tech from an investment perspective. Many people are saying it's now the death of ad tech. How do you think about ad tech as a prospective investment and for current portfolio companies? I'll start. Uh, we've been investing in ad tech for, I've been at First Round for 11 years. We've probably even been a little bit before that and uh, have been pretty active throughout. And I think th there's, been, there's been a shift uh, in perception, I think, of the category. I think right now it's in a little bit of a, of a tough place where it doesn't feel like there's enough exit opportunities. In fact, I'll be honest, earlier today when I heard the, the stat that there were 50 exits over $100 million I, in the last year, it, it almost didn't add up because it doesn't feel like that to us. I asked, I asked two other fellow investors who weren't in the room and one of them guessed 10 and the other guessed 15. Like it, it just seems like a little bit of a disconnect. And I think that the, the industry, but I think it's, like I'm cautiously optimistic overall, like there's a lot of good signs lining up that the companies that are left and standing um, will find homes or will go public. We're investors in AppNexus, we hope that happens soon. Uh, but there's definitely been a little, a little shift in the, in the perception, uh, I, I think generally from what was uh, maybe irrationally exuberant to like maybe on the other end of the spectrum where you, know, you could be a little contrarian to be excited about ad tech right now. Yeah, I would uh, you know, concur with a lot of that. And I think that you know, for us at Revel, I think ad tech, martech, sales tech, a lot of this stuff has merged uh, in the space as the space has evolved, as we're serving multiple different customer sets, multiple different business models. I think certainly you know, something we're not looking at are your you know, traditional old school models you know, that we, we all grew up with, much more uh, CPM, IO based businesses, and now much more SaaS relevant. But for us, I think there's, you know, the, the way we look at it is there's a, a ton of good opportunity uh, within the space and, 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 and pretty excited. And I think there are some depressed valuations uh, that, that just provides more opportunity. Yeah, the, the, the separation that Chris is talking about, we see and are cognizant of the, the public markets simply do not, do not in any way, shape, or form reward IO or campaign based companies, period. And as a result, if you're looking at the downstream investment environment, if the company doesn't have a platform or SaaS orientation, or at least can act like it does, there's almost no chance for investment from our firm. Uh, we learned this really well with TubeMogul. We were early, early investors in them, and I know Terry and some people helped with that original S1 when they went public. And one of the neat tricks that TubeMogul did before getting acquired by Adobe was it demonstrated that there was a combination of both campaign as well as infrastructure spend. And for a while, the company traded very, very well in the public markets because it was viewed as a SaaS multiple company as opposed to an IO-based multiple company. And so, unfortunately, we have a dual world. If you're not in a predictable recurring revenue type spot, you're a 2x revenues company. If you're a SaaS company, you can get a 10x. And so, you know, that's, that's probably not great to hear for a lot of people in this audience, but that's the nature of the downstream market. And as a result, a lot of companies have higher private market valuations than public valuations, seizing up the whole ecosystem. I agree with all that. I think I would add from a, from a private equity perspective, uh, I think ad tech is just now becoming alive, so very much not dead. If you look at the evolution of business models, as Chris and Paul have, have discussed, recurring revenue, uh, selling outcomes, um, pricing transactions on a cost plus model as opposed to a kind of an opaque black box. Those are all things that private equity can really rally around and invest behind. And I think the world that we came from, which was more opaque, which was more IO based, which was selling impressions, who knew how valuable they were. Uh, that, that was a very difficult proposition for a private equity investor to, uh, to get behind. Just to add one other thought is, is if you stop and look back, like just take the last 10 years, I checked uh, the, the, the digital, ad industry 
was about 39 billion in 2007, and it's about 222 billion today. So it's a it's a 19 percent uh, compound annual growth rate at that scale, which is pretty unprecedented. If you look at a lot of our companies, and you told me when we invested the revenues that they would be at or the size or scale of the company, we would have been doing backflips. But a lot of them are caught up in issues like lack of profitability or they're overvalued. Like, you know, from the, the first unicorn being named, I think there's now 200 or something like that. And I think there's a lot of private companies that are just m mispriced for, for an exit or to be in the public market. You all have brought up a number of the themes that I want to cover, but just to sort of try to take them at least one at a time. Uh, MarTech is a label that's getting a lot of play. Chris, you mentioned it specifically. Uh, now, one of the things we experienced in ad tech was the coming of an ad tech bubble when business models really weren't getting substantiated. Do you think that we have a risk of getting into a, quote, MarTech bubble? And where do you see us in the, in the cycle for this investment category? I think, you know, there's a ton of innovation. I th a lot of the topics that we talked about today and a lot of these tracks around identity, personalization, a lot of the things that the walled gardens are doing. You look at Amazon, Facebook, Google, everybody outside of, of those walled gardens need those solutions. Uh, so there's a lot of ripe stuff going on to kind of reinvent or to really advance the marketer-consumer relationship, artificial intelligence being one of those. So I think we're far from a situation where we've got, you know, an, an overinvestment or an overvaluation in MarTech specifically. B by the way, I would say that the separation between ad tech, sales tech, and and MarTech is not the right separation. It's what is your business model in terms of recurring revenue? Is it SaaS-based, platform-based? Is it, you know, some of the trading desks play a hybrid role. That, that'll kind of leave out of the taxonomy. That's almost a special case. But by and large, you know, which are you? And which multiple are you gonna end up getting? When you're in the SaaS multiple, at least you have a whole world of a high rent district of neighbors to get compared to, as opposed to an ad tech where you can be in the low rent district in terms of the multiple. So when we look at a company, we don't categorize it as ad tech, martech, sales tech. We don't care at all. We go, oh, campaign based, SaaS based. Okay, got it. All I need to know. I don't need to put it in another bucket. So does that affect how you think about co how companies use their cash? I mean company raises a new round of funds, typically we see them spend a huge amount on new people, new resources, marketing their own business, trade marketing in particular. So as investors, how do you advise your CEOs on resource allocation? Uh, I, I'll, uh, I'll take that one. I think there's been a big, big shift. There were, there were so many dollars that were so readily available from folks like us and others that that it was growth at any cost, or there was always an ability to raise the next round at a higher price, which, which led to some really undisciplined behavior that has you know, caught up with a lot of people. In, in, the, in the, uh, the section where some of the recently acquired CEOs were talking, there, there's, a, there's a world of difference when you can control your own destiny and get to break even or to profitability. And I think a lot of companies that are around today almost by definition are being forced to get into that situation, and uh, uh, and it, it really helps focus the company, and I think it opens up a whole other world of 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 M and A opportunity when you go from being a black hole, they're trying to figure out how much to allocate in an acquisition versus something that is break even or even accretive, and I think everybody like the, I, I I coach my companies to try and get into that self, uh, self-sufficient self land. Yeah, no, that's a great point. I totally agree. I was actually advising two people this afternoon just, just in asking, that they were asking what should, you know, what would your recommendation be around uh, capital? And I said the same thing to both of them. One was look under your hood. If you've got good technology, you've got self-service, you're really thinking about, you know, the coming wave of, of AI and how good is your technology. If you've got an issue there, think about raising. And if you don't, in terms of a crowded ad tech 
marketplace get profitable because that drives a lot of optionality. I'll make one ancillary point because I think that's all well said. I view the use of proceeds slide in general as the single most useful slide in any deck when I get pitched. I view that as the ultimate IQ test of any CEO that comes into our office. And if you come into our office without a, a good explanation of the use of proceeds, you almost immediately failed the test before anything else. I don't care how good your tech was, I don't care how awesome your team was, if you can't articulate how the money is gonna get spent to accelerate your plan, you, you failed. And I would just add, when you're looking at the use of proceeds, I mean, we're maniacally focused on unit economics, so customer lifetime value to customer acquisition cost, almost irrespective of the category. So just because a category has a lot of potential, uh, we're not as sympathetic to throwing money at potential. We like to throw money behind kind of proven customer you know, business models. Changing gears a little bit around co-investors. Um, one question I was asked often when I was at WPP is, well, are there trade-offs to taking strategic investment? And I'm interested in your perspective on that. Yeah, I, was, I actually was on a panel on that topic last week at Propeller. Any of you there? It was like 95 degrees on the waterfront. One of the most interesting events I was ever at. When's the last time you did an outdoor event for tech? Kind of odd. But it was, it was neat. We did a whole panel on this topic for an hour. And it really is interesting how different the world is now than 10 years ago when I did my last company, Aggregate Knowledge. 10 years ago, there was a rule in venture, don't ever take your first money from a strategic. But now with the rounds so fluid and the seeds so often and the notes so rolling, it's no longer the rule. It's, you know, if uh, WPP has come in because they're a customer, that's a good signal now as opposed to a quasi-negotiated pre-sale. I think the corporate strategics also are behaving better and that they know that in order to play this early stage game, they need to act more like financial investors as opposed to buying call options on the companies. And so I think it's really a different world ten year, versus 10 years ago and one in which it's much better for the entrepreneur because the strategics and customer financing are now a much more available option that doesn't screw up the cap table. I, I've seen... Over the years, I could point to a lot of examples where there's been bad behavior and a, and a negative uh, impact on, on a strategic investor, but also many where it's worked out well. And I think it's really important how you structure them. And I'm seeing them being done smarter and smarter. And I also think it ties into when we, when, again, the panel on the, the recent acquisitions and talking about how they had had commercial multi-year relationships with the ultimate acquirer, actually it was the, the Oracle person speaking about. And I think there's gold in that. Like I think when in a properly structured, you know, investment that might have a commercial relationship tied to it, that might have warrant coverage and kickers if certain revenue levels are hit, an observer seat, like that's a lightweight but super aligned kind of a structure where, where everything can work well, versus like, and sometimes you get a term sheet and it's basically they want to write a first refusal and yep. board seats and it just feels too heavy and that's the kind of thing you want to avoid. It's almost like you're reading my notes and you know what my next question is going to be. <laughs> <laughs> we heard on the winner's panel at lunchtime about exit scenarios for a number of companies and I was uh, somewhat surprised to hear private equity came up a couple of times because you don't usually associate private equity with investments in this category, but I think we're now seeing um, real activity in private equity, and I thought Steve could give us some comments on, on your perspective on that. Yeah, happy to do it. So I, th I think for those of you that are used to working with uh, venture capital, the key difference in private equity is that when we're constructing portfolios, we can tolerate principal loss in maybe 15% of our investments, maybe, 10% for a good fund. So we've got to be able to sort of close our eyes when we're meeting with the company and you know, project out five to seven years and have a high degree of conviction that this company will be worth at least as much at that point in time than they are now, almost above all else. I mean, we'd gladly trade the opportunity to quintuple the size of the business just to have the extra comfort that it will look similar to the way it does now. Um, and when you do that, I think it, you know, the evolution that we talked about earlier of moving towards business models that are frankly much more defensible than I think maybe AdTech 1.0, it helps out a lot. Um, also, as the pace of, of evolution slows down, even if that comes with a slowdown in the overall growth of the market, that'll help a lot too. And I think all these things are coming together and where we, you know, we've, we've basically barely seen any private equity investment in the category at all. I mean, as a 
uh, for the economy at large, PE accounts for 25 to 30 percent of all deal activity. Uh, if we were to try to, to try to guess what it's been in ad tech over the last five years, I mean, maybe one, two, three percent, maybe a little bit more MarTech. Uh, we made an investment in a uh, MarTech business, Cision, that's now become our largest investment ever. Uh, I, I would struggle to even call it your mother's MarTech. It's really more your, your grandmother's. Uh, we started with a business that was founded in the late 1800s doing press clippings. We augmented it with a next generation capability of, uh, of newswires. Uh, and we're trying to build around that. But these are, this is a business that's been around 100 years. And I think on the periphery, we can add capabilities that make it more relevant uh, within the context of modern marketing techniques. That's one example. But I think we'll see a lot more going forward, certainly more than we have in the past. Yeah, we, we've also, you know, Wellington participated in the Series D of the Trade Desk last year. They also participated in uh, financing with Defy uh, last year as well as, as other points. But, but I sense it's an opportunity. I think there's a lot of great companies and assets and that, that would be looking for opportunities to be part of a bigger vision or to... Um, be, you know, be part of something else and, and something bigger, and and uh, I, I would expect that we'll see more of that going forward. Chris, you talked about investors like Wellington, for example, and I don't even want to call them out or that that deal out in particular, but I'll just say right now there's a lot of talk about companies just staying private because they can, and companies are getting to sort of s s really significant size and continuing to be private private companies. Should that be a considered option for companies raising venture capital? I think with, with my hat, from a, from a VC point of view, when we look at an investment, we're looking at a target holding period of five years. Sometimes it'll be on, on the lower end of that. Sometimes it'll you know, go out double that. Uh, so for us, you know, exits, strategic exits, or you know, IPOs are the the typical path, and that's what we're we're looking for, rather than companies uh, remaining private. You know, strictly from a return point of view. But we are in a new world. We have a couple portfolio companies that are generating tens of millions of dollars of free cash a month, and those CEOs have zero desire to go public. And it's actually a funny conversation to sometimes have. At some point, you ask the CEO, "What do you want to do when you grow up?" Right? Because there's a there's a kind of almost a transformation of the company required to get to a liquidity event when you're generating that much free cash on a monthly basis. And a lot of our companies, when they get to that spot, and we actually have a couple in that spot, they kind of don't want to do all the things required to go public. They're like, that's too much work. I'm, I'm having a good time doing what I'm doing. So I, I'm saying this is happening more than I think people appreciate, and I don't think there's a, an answer or a playbook for how to deal with this now, because this didn't used to happen at the volume at which it's happening now. I guess that's also where we might turn to the private equity world as an alternative. And I think the, the struggle there becomes, uh, becomes valuation. So clearly, public investors have a lower cost of capital than private equity firms. And in this category, I think the, the appetite for leverage to, to make our overall cost of capital competitive with the public markets has been limited up until this point. So I can see how it's a struggle with the management teams of the companies that you work with of being private would be great. but I also like that public market exit valuation. I'd really love the strategic valuation and how do you balance all those objectives? And we're seeing early, we're seeing the quasi rounds happen as well where the private equity person will buy a stake from the earlier investors to get to their ownership target, kind of taking the heat off people like me, Chris and Chris. You know, so we, you know, we, we, we get out 10x our basis and we're letting the rest ride. So I think we're gonna see more of that because that maybe is the best balance of interests and it's not that you're not still interested in those companies, it's just that you can now stomach the exit being essentially indefinitely far out because you've got your basis plus back. We could probably keep going on this one, but uh, just as I look at the clock, and I wanna make sure I get this question to all the, um, the minds here on the podium, what do you think about winners, and from an investment standpoint, winners, how they look today versus what the winners of tomorrow are gonna look like? I'll steal Paul's like more, more SaaS, less uh, empty calorie IO based <laughs> revenues. 
I would say it's definitely digging in under the hood, as I mentioned before, and really looking at you know the impacts uh, and the promise and, and what we're seeing in terms of machine learning. Artificial intelligence, I think that is really ripe. It's just beginning, but really ripe to drive a, a major seismic shift in how marketers and consumers are, you know, that whole relationship. So I think, you know, looking under the hood at what's there today versus, you know, being prepared and, 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 and positioned for, for AI. Sheila, I hope I don't know the answer to the question because we like to invest in wacky and off the wall things. So I'm hoping some of the wacky and off the wall things in our portfolio are the answer to your question because it's more fun that way. So I'm gonna say companies that can effectively execute consolidation, especially as the pace of new venture dollars into some of these categories slow down. There's so, there are a lot of companies with duplicative infrastructure, a lot of synergies to be had, a lot of capabilities to be built into larger businesses and a lot of value to be created that way. Well, there you have it. Our time is up. Thank you, panelists. Very good. Thank you.